Thanksgiving is right around the corner. I thought this would be appropriate. I want you to understand that this is going to be a very, very elementary sermon. But you know, sometimes we need to be reminded of those elementary things. Amen. The holiday that is upcoming is called what? Thanksgiving. Now, I know every person in this room, I really believe this, I know every person in this room is thankful, right? And normally this time of year, we want to say what we're thankful for. But the, uh, the holiday is not called Be Thankful Day. It's called what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Giving of thanks. Is there a difference in being thankful and giving thanks? Think about it for a minute. How many people around you are you thankful for? How many times do you give them that thanks? See the difference? Are you giving the thanks that you should, not only to the Lord, but the people around you? Uh, you know, a lot of times we, and I've heard this and it's so sad, we get down, some, someone loves, loses a loved one and they say, oh, I wished I would have said what I wanted to say. You know, we have people around us every day. If you're thankful for them, why don't you give them thanks? Amen? If you're thankful to God, why don't you give Him thanks? So instead of just saying what you're thankful for this year, why don't you give some thanks? Like the holiday tells us to do. Let's look at Psalm 100, and we're going to talk about giving thanks today. Uh, there's only five short verses. So let's look at them together. Psalm 100, beginning in verse 1. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. There in verse 1 it begins, and I'm sure you've heard this verse before. It says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. You know, I hear that verse used a lot. Normally we're, we're kind of telling a joke when we say it. No, I'm not going to sing because my... My voice wouldn't be very joyful. You ever heard that joke? Uh, it happens a lot in churches. But what is this talking about? Is it talking about just singing? Think about it. Uh, I don't want to get overly metaphoric today, but you know, our, our whole lives are noisy. Think about it. Our whole lives are noisy. Not only do we speak, but our actions are noisy. In other words, people notice, God notices. Right here it says, make a joyful noise. All ye lands. The, the phrase all ye lands means all the earth. In other words, everyone. What does God want us to be doing daily? You know, we've talked a lot about this lately, about our daily job for God. And sometimes I really think we overlook the simple things. And it's going to be the simple things that are going to matter in the end. Right here, how much do we walk through our life making a joyful noise the things we speak the actions that we have how much are our words and our actions causing joy you know if we don't watch it normally we walk around giving complaints instead of giving thanks how many times do we focus on the negatives instead of the positives isn't that almost natural to do how many of you today got up and sometime between here and church come on i did it be honest said something about how cold it is today. Amen. No. And you were really saying, boy, I wish it was a little warmer. Sometimes it's so easy to focus on the negative, isn't it? But yet, this whole psalm is talking about doing just the opposite. Make a joyful noise. Look at verse 2 for just a moment. Serve the Lord with what? Gladness. And it even goes on there in verse 2 and says, Come before His presence with singing. Now how many of you have been happy enough just to break out in song lately? Have you ever done that ever in your life? Uh, I remember 
a long time before I got married, I was still a Little Rock police officer. I was living with a guy that uh, we went to church with for, for years. And uh, I worked nights. And, uh, of course, I would come in. It, it might be 6 or 7 in the morning, you know. And uh, if I was going to get any uh, housework done or anything like that, it would be right then. So I would uh, start doing the dishes or vacuuming the floor, and I'd normally turn on the... Uh, the Gaither gospel music was big back then. I'd normally turn that on, start singing along with it. And, uh, of course, he would get up and he'd say, it's way too early to be happy. What do you do? Uh, but, you know, there's something about just breaking out in song because you're thankful. Have you been that happy lately? If we're always dwelling on the negative, we're not ever going to be that happy. Uh, do y'all know why, and, and by the way, this has been scientifically proven, do y'all know why depression comes? And we all can get down and depressed at times. Have you ever been down and depressed? Do you know why depression comes? And this is the absolute truth. We allow it to come. What we dwell on becomes what holds us down. Uh, the Bible even talks about this as well. We actually have the ability to lift ourselves up out of the pit of depression by what we think about. Do you really think it's that easy? Start watching what you think. Start watching what you say. Start watching what you do. Make them be positive things instead of negative. Right? Look at verse 1 again. Make a what? What kind of noise? Joyful. Even the joke that we, we say in church all the time, I'm not going to sing because my voice ain't joyful, is negative. Think about all the negative things we say. Let's be positive. Amen? Is there something to be positive about today? I know there's things to be negative about. I hurt. I feel awful. It's cold outside. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we can sit here and think about the negatives. But is there any positives today? Let's think, is there anything good today? Think about how often people go through the list of the bad things. Well, here's the bad things about my family. Here's the bad things about my church. Boy, if we could just change them, it'd be fine. Y'all remember several weeks ago I told you you're never going to change anything, so might as well quit complaining about it. Be thankful for what's right. Amen? Is there anything right in our country? Is there anything right in your family? Is there anything right in this church? Let's be thankful. Not only be thankful, let's give some thanks. Amen? How long has it been since you thanked your family? How long has it been since you thanked your church family? How long has it been since you thanked your God? Sometimes our prayer life turns into, God, help me here. God, help me here. God, help me here. Sometimes our prayer life turns into negative Nelly. All we give to God is the negatives. Uh, have you all recited to yourself the Lord's Prayer lately? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Go through that in your mind and show me a negative in there. Now, don't get me wrong, the Bible tells us we can cry out to God for help. Within that prayer, it says, give us our daily bread. But there is no negatives. And the very first thing that prayer does is lift up God and put Him in His rightful place. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All of that is said before He ever says, give us our daily bread. How much do we talk about God and His greatness? How much do we tell Him thanks? Verse 2 again, it says, Serve the Lord with gladness. How many days do we go along being glad that we are His servants? Come on, be honest. How many of you woke up this morning and go, Oh, i got to go to church. Not that you didn't want to go to church, but it, how, how come, uh, I've always wondered this, Church is always later than any work day has ever started. Amen? Most people have to be at work by 8, at 9 at the latest, right? Our Sunday school doesn't start until when? 10 o'clock. Why is it that the devil makes Sunday harder than sometimes Thursday and Friday? How many people get up and go, Oh, is that serving God with gladness? Is that coming before God 
with singing as it says there in verse 2? Look down to verse 3 in our text. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. Now again, I told you this is elementary stuff, but we need to remind ourselves, why is He saying this? Think about this in relation to this psalm. Why is He saying this at this point right now? Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Why would He say that right now? There's several reasons, but I want you to think about it. Do you know why we normally dwell on the negatives and talk about the negatives? Because we're wanting to get things, come on, y'all admit it, it's true. We're wanting to get things the way we want them. Is that not true? We want the weather how we want it to be. We want church the way we want it to be. We want our family the way we want it to be. Now, Look back through this verse and tell me if there's a reason he gave us this verse. This is the day that the... Come on, finish this verse with me. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Whose day is this? And I don't mean just Sunday. I mean every day. Whose day is this? Whose day does it belong to? God. Whose church is this? Whose family is your family? Who, does, who do I belong to? You know, the Bible says our bodies are not even our own. Especially as a saved person, because not only did he create you, he also died for you. As you're looking through that verse and thinking... This should change our mind around. Instead of trying to change things the way we want them to do, we need to realize that these things belong to God. He is God. Look at that verse 3 again. Know ye that the Lord, He is God. It is He that hath made us and not we ourselves. In other words, He is the Creator. Uh, do y'all mind turning to Isaiah 43 for just a minute? Isaiah 43. Can everybody agree with me that one thing that all, one problem that all humans have would be pride? Would y'all say that that's true? Sometimes we all think the world at least should revolve around us. Come on, admit it, we all tend to feel that way sometimes. We get to thinking of ourselves more important than we really are. Here in Isaiah 43, God gives us the very reason that we were created. The very reason you were created, okay? Sometimes we don't want to admit this, but oh, this is good if we can. Isaiah 43, and look down to verse 7. Write this verse down somewhere. This is a good one. You'll want to come back to it. Even everyone that is called by my name. Of course, we're getting right in the middle of a of a context, but it's okay. We can figure it out. The word for means because, because I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Go back to that phrase, I have created him for my glory. The word glory, y'all have heard this several times. It means uh, to magnify and manifest God's presence. In other words, God created us especially those that are called by his name in that text. In other words, meaning those that are willing to serve him. He created everyone, though, for his glory, to magnify and manifest his presence. Think about that. From the very beginning, we were created for his glory. Now, again, I want you to think about most of the times that we gripe and complain, most of the times that we do not give thanksgiving, what are we trying to do? We're trying to magnify, magnify and manifest our little world. We want to change our family to the way we want it again. We want to change our church the way we want it. Are we trying to magnify and manifest God or ourselves? How, many, how much of our lives is dominated by those thoughts and those feelings? To even really convict you and think about it, I want you to think back to your very, 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 very happiest times in life. Why are they happy? 
most of the time it's because things lined up the way we really wanted them to line up. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't find joy in those times. But I'm saying there is a greater happiness outside of everything just going the way you want it to go. And did you know so many people never, ever find a happiness outside of that? Remember when I started this sermon, I said it's elementary? It is. You want to graduate from elementary to junior high in Christianity? Start finding joy outside of those simple little things that when things go the way you want them to go. Is it possible for us to have joy when things go differently than we want? Only if, listen, only if we're living for a higher purpose than ourselves. I use this all the time. Remember the men that left the jail being beaten. The Bible says they were rejoicing. Amen? Okay, guys, things, this is easy to see. Things did not go the way they wanted them to go. Can we all agree with that? Not only were they arrested for preaching the word, they were beaten. They were also commanded never to do it again. By all physical things, everything that they were working toward looked like it had just ended. But yet they left rejoicing. How is that possible? Nothing went the way they wanted it to go. They were living beyond themselves. They were not living for themselves. They were not living to try to make their circumstances perfect for themselves. They were living for the glory of God. You want to find more joy than you've ever had in life? Look at, look at that Isaiah 43, 7 one more time. You want to find more joy than you've ever had? Start living for the very purpose you were created. Look what it says. I have created him for my glory. You don't have to wonder why you're on this earth. You know that's something that people seek their whole lives. You do not have to wonder why you're here. This verse tells you exactly why God created you. You were created to give glory to God. You were created to magnify and manifest His presence. You want to find true joy? Start fulfilling your very purpose in life. There's no greater joy. Go back to our text. And I want to ask you something as you're turning. Be honest. Have you ever experienced that peace of God that passes all understanding that the Bible talks about? Have you ever experienced it? You say, well, is there something wrong with me if I haven't experienced it? I, I, I'm not going to put a percentage on this, but I would say a high number of Christians never get to experience that fully. Because they're too wrapped up in self. They're too wrapped up in this is not the way I want it to be. Think about how much of our life we go through saying this is not how I want it to be instead of giving thanks for how it is. Uh, Y'all know the grass is always greener on the other side, right? You know what that means? I want y'all to... This is profound, okay? Take this. You may be in the very happiest time of your life right now. But you're not going to know it until it's over. Have you ever looked back at times in your life and go, Boy, I should have enjoyed that better. That was, that was good. You ever done that? You may be in the happiest time of your life right now, but you're not going to know it until it's over. Why can't we enjoy it while it's going on? Folks, because we're not focused on the right things. We're focused on the negatives. We're focused on what's not like we want it. You're never going to get everything in a row exactly the way you want it. Ever. And many times that's why we don't enjoy where we're at. Go back to our text here in Psalm 100. Verse 4 in our text. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. There's that word. Not just being thankful, and even the time the word thankful shows up here in this verse, go on down. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful. But it, look, it don't just say be thankful. It says be thankful how? Unto him. In other words, give that thanks unto him. It could be translated thanksgiving again. It's more than just being thankful. Well, I'm thankful. Again, I believe everyone sitting in this room is thankful. I'm thankful when I make myself think about it. 
the holiday that we're coming up on is probably, uh, in my opinion, the greatest holiday there is. It's better than Christmas. It's better than Easter. You say, well, how's that? Well, come and I'll tell you privately how it is, but I'll tell you a little bit. Thanksgiving was actually, or something very similar, was instituted by God to the Jewish people. One of the feasts that they had was almost identical to Thanksgiving every year. In fact, it's where we have our origin of Thanksgiving. It's very, very, very scriptural and very biblical. And I know you see it in our country. It's kind of a shame we go right from Halloween to Christmas now. We skip right over the one that's the most important. Uh, I saw something so cute this week. Uh, we're the only country the day after. And now I want y'all to think of it. What is the day after Thanksgiving called now? Black Friday. Black Friday. <laughs> we're the only place in the world after the day that we tell God how thankful we are. We trample people to death trying to get stuff we don't have. Are we truly thankful? Are we truly giving thanks? Enter into his gates. Now this is important. Enter into his gates. Where is God's gates? He's not telling us to go to heaven and the pearly gates, is he? Where is his gates? Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Come on, this is significant that it didn't say enter into your house or it says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, unto his courts with praise. How do we get to his gates and his courts? Is that talking about the church house? What's it talking about? This is good stuff. How often in your life are you going where you want to go or are you going where God wants you to go? Now slow down and think about that. How much of your life has been decided this is where I want to go? And how much of your life has been decided this is where I know God wants me to go? The jobs that you took, the places you moved. Even think about churches that people join. Do they join it because God wants them there? Or because they want it? How many people go to a church and say things like this? What does your church have for me and my family? How many times do we seek God's will? You know, I wonder if God has some churches and some people that he wants to go there to make that church better. In other words, church is a place of service, right? Do you think God ever tries to draw someone to a church so that they can make that church better and work in that church? If we want a church that's perfect to what we want when we get there, what are we going to do to make it any better? Y'all understand what I'm saying? How many times do we think, what is God's will in my life? Where does God want me to go? The idea here of his gates and his courts, not only is it a reference, of course, in Jerusalem, it's also a heavenly reference, but it's a metaphor, it's a metaphor in our life to walk where he wants us to walk. Are you walking where God wants you to walk? Think about it. Are you even considering his will before you act? And notice what it says. When you start entering his way and his courts, it tells you two things. Give him thanksgiving. Give him praise. Do you believe that God's way is better than your way? Don't answer that. If you start going his way, then you believe it. Faith without works is dead, right? You can say you believe it all day long, but if you don't do it, you don't believe it. Uh, again, I hate to always talk about the stuff going on in my life, but again, I, I know it. I'm not, please understand I'm not putting my stuff above yours. I, I can just use mine as an example. But I look at my own life and the, the, the health that I'm dealing with right now. Of course I would want it another way, right? But is there any way to be thankful for how it is? Is it possible to look at life that way instead of looking at the negative and wanting it different? Is it possible to be thankful for how it is? 
I love this. I know I pointed this out to you before. But in your mind, say with me the 23rd Psalm. Do you all know the 23rd Psalm? Almost by memory anyway. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. Okay, stop right there for, for a minute. If the Lord is your shepherd. In other words, if you're letting him lead you. If you're not following your wishes and wants. If you're following his. It says, I shall not want. Because he maketh me. I love that word. Lie down in green pastures. Remember what I said. You may be at the happiest time of your life. But you won't know it. You may be in that green pasture. But he has to make you lay down. Isn't that something? He has to make you lie down. Because we always think it's greener where? Somewhere else. Somewhere else. Something. If we, if we could just fix this and fix that. We always, there's always something. Isn't there? Is it possible for us to slow down and look at our present circumstance and be thankful for things? You know, I love the song and I love the uh, thing that we do, counting your blessings. That is a good thing to do. To sit down and just start thinking, this is what I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for this. I'm thankful for this. I'm thankful for this. You start changing your mind. You start thinking about what's right in your life instead of what's wrong. Again, I believe we go through most of our life thinking about what's wrong instead of thinking about what's right. Now, please, please notice here in verse 4, and I'm going to make this point, and I really want you to get it, okay? Enter into his gates. That means God's way. Where he wants you to be. And it says, with thanksgiving. Not just being thankful. But what are we going to start having to do if we're going to follow God's will and God's way? Do you believe that do you believe that simply you thanking God and thanking people around you, do you think that can make a difference in your life and in people's lives? Folks, I'm telling you, we overlook these little bitty things. Uh, you want to be happier? You want to make more of an effect on someone's life? Uh, you know this. Sometimes some of the l least little things can be the things that turn your day either to the good or to the bad. Sometimes a little bitty gesture can make your day or ruin your day. How much thanks do you give? I know how much complaining and griping we give, but how much thanks do we give? How much do you thank the people around you? Uh, I won't ask for hands raised or nobody to amen or anything like this. But married couples, y'all can smile if you want to. Do we all have things that we would change in our mates? Instead of dwelling on that, why don't we not only think, but thank them for the things that are right? Do we all have things in our mates that are right that we could thank them for? How often do you give them thanks? I know you're thankful, but how often do you give thanks? It's human nature not to thank them for the good stuff, but to gripe about the bad stuff, isn't it? Isn't it wonderful that God told us to live above our human nature? Go on down here in verse 4. Not only are we to give that thanks, enter into His courts with Praise, be thankful unto Him. Give that thanks unto Him and bless His name. Do we have things today to thank God for? Have you done it? Have you truly given Him thanks today? How many times have you just sat down and prayed to Him for nothing else other than to thank Him? I know if you're like me, sometimes our most earnest prayers is when we find ourselves Again, in a situation we don't want to be in. My family member's sick, and I, I don't want that person sick, so God, please. Or I'm about to lose my job, God, please. That's when our prayers get earnest. Again, when we're in a spot we don't want to be in. How many times do we have earnest prayers just thanking God? 
How many times have you poured your heart out giving Him true praise and nothing else? Y'all tell me, which do you like better? Do you like somebody coming to you and griping? Or somebody coming and saying, I just wanted to tell you thank you. Which is nicer? Which is better? Which one do you think pleases God more? Be honest with yourself right now. How much of a joyful noise is your life making? Your life is making noise. It's making noise to all the people around you. How joyful is it? Look at the last verse. The word for in verse 5 means what? Because. Why should we be thanking Him? Because the Lord is good. Just stop right there. You know, this hit me one day, and I hate to admit, I was already a, a master student working on a thesis, and it was uh, just about the study of God, and, and this thought, I, I had always just taken for granted our loving and good God. But this thought passed over my head. What if God wasn't good? God doesn't have to be good. He's all powerful. He can do anything He wants, right? He created you. He can do whatever He wants. We take for granted that He's good. We take for granted that His, look what, on down what this says in His truth endureth to all generations. His mercy is everlasting. We take that for granted. We take it for granted that we can call out and we know He's going to be merciful. Come on, be honest. How many times do you take that for granted? How many times because of His goodness do you not fear Him the way you should? Just ponder for a minute if we didn't have a good God. Think about if He hadn't offered salvation to us. He didn't have to, did He? He would still be just in not doing that. Think about if we had a God that didn't want to lead us into those pastures. That didn't want to bless us. Look at what we've got, guys. We've got a creator that loves us more than anybody's ever loved us. Isn't that something to be thankful for no matter what's going on? Wow! How much do we take that for granted and just kind of push it aside? The Lord is good. His mercy, look at that verse 5. His mercy is everlasting. We never have to doubt His mercy. That means giving us something we don't deserve. Gosh, I want y'all to get this before we quit. So many times we're wrapped up in what we do deserve. Be honest, we all do it at times. We've all uttered the words, That's not fair. At least you thought it, whether you've said it or not. You know, the word mercy means giving us something we don't deserve. How many times do we ponder that what we have every day, we don't deserve it? Folks, we don't even deserve life, and I mean breath. The Bible says that all are sinners and the wages of sin is death. But yet we live because of God's mercy. And we have the audacity to say something that happens is not fair. Let me tell you a little bit about God's mercy. Again, it's elementary, you know it, but let's praise God for it. Not only did He allow us breath, He provided the very way to have eternal life. Amen. And you know, I find this Unreal when you really start thinking about it. Again, some other things we take for granted. God could have made salvation anyway. He could have said, okay, there's ten things you've got to accomplish in your life. If you don't, you don't get to go to heaven. You know, there's some religions that try to do that to you. But God never did that. God is the one that did all the work necessary for our salvation. And please don't push it aside. It was work. He lived his whole life. He came to this earth as a human, lived a whole sinless life, enduring all the things that we endure, yet doing it perfectly. 
enduring temptation and enduring all, all the things that we endure. The Bible says he became obedient, not just obedient, obedient unto death, not just death, but quite honestly, a death that we probably couldn't even imagine. Somebody came to me the other day and said, have you ever seen that movie? Uh, and I've gone blank now. It's the, the new one about Jesus and his crucifixion. Passion of the yeah, the Passion of the Christ. Somebody asked, have you ever seen it? I said, yeah, I saw it. You know, I believe the, the brutality that they show in that movie probably does not even touch what really happened. And some people said that that was too brutal. And folks, he not only endured the physical things, he endured spiritual things that we can't even imagine. He became mine and your sin. It was placed upon him on the cross. Look at the last section of verse 5, the last little line. His mercy endures, is everlasting. His truth endureth. What does it say? To all generations. We're 2,000 years from Jesus. But I don't believe there's a person in this room that doubts that his mercy is sitting there right, right here today waiting on you. It endures to all generations. It's here. Folks, not only did he die for you. And I'm going to give you a verse and just get this in your mind and say it to yourself. If he died for me, how will he not also give me all things? That's what the Bible says. Why do we ever doubt his love? Why do we ever doubt his leadership? He was willing to die for you, amen? If he would do that, do you think he'd just stop loving you after that? There may be somebody here that does not know Jesus as their Savior. I know most of you, and I know most of you have professed. But maybe there is someone. Can I, can I say one other thing before we quit? Go ahead, y'all say no, I'm going to say it anyway. You know why we don't have to... You know why we can change our outlook on life? Our outlook on life is normally what's best for me and my family. You know why we don't have to think that way anymore? Because God's already doing it for you. And He knows a lot more than you and me. In other words, if you start going God's way, you actually will be doing what's best for you and your family. In regards for salvation, He looked out for you and provided everything you needed before you even knew you needed it. Folks, He's doing that in every aspect of life. Have you just given Him thanks? I don't know about you, but I've got some things that I need to ask forgiveness for. Some griping and some complaining and some whining. I need to start giving more thanks and giving more praise. Not only to God, but to the people around me. Father, as we humbly bow in your presence, we thank you for this time to be reminded of how good you are to us. Of how thankful we should truly be to you. But not only that, Father, we realize that we should give you thanks much more than we do. Father, we pray if there's one here today that does not know your Son as their personal Savior, that through your Spirit today they would understand that all they have to do is to call out to you in faith, asking, asking you to save them through Jesus. Father, we ask for your spirit to be working in their lives right now. Maybe there are other moves that need to be made today. Father, we know that your word does not return void. We ask you to be working in hearts and lives right now. But Father, we ask you to help each of us see the need of giving thanks more each and every day of putting the negative things not only out of our vocabulary, but out of our minds. The complaints, the worries, the fears, the bitterness. Father, help us to 
look at the people around us, the situations around us. Not only be thankful, but to give thanks. And Father, help us today and in the days to come. Come before your throne understanding and giving you the thanks that you deserve. You deserve so much more thanks than we ever give. Thank you for being that good God. Just thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love. I take it for granted so many times. I know your mercy is always available. No matter what I do. Forgive me for taking it for granted. Thank you God for being such a loving and wonderful God. A God that wants to be involved in our lives. We thank you for being right here with us right now. Touching hearts and lives. We just thank you. Help us to do the very thing that that verse of scripture says. Today is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Help us to do that. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Let's